Eugenia Kim, my dearest friend, who just finished her PhD and officially entered the art world, is a young new media artist full of potential. When we were at school, I visited her exhibition Lyceum, and today we are going to talk about her new artwork in progress move over Skype. Hi, Eugenia. Uh, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I heard that you have a new artwork, Moo. Oh, uh, yes. So... Yeah, so could you please briefly introduce your work in progress, Moo, to our audiences so that they have a broad picture of the artwork? The title Mu actually refers to three different Chinese characters. The first character refers to shamanism. The second character is the character for dance in Korean. It comes out as new, other than the Chinese pronunciation. And then the third Chinese character refers to a Buddhist concept, sort of negation, so to speak. And so what these three things have in common is that in Korean culture, dance is a very important part of being a shaman. So from this very messy, mixed pot of Korean culture, I am creating a VR narrative. It follows a character that is called Gongshin, and Gongshin is named after someone who was actually a shaman in Korean culture. But basically the narrative follows this character, Gongshin, as she goes through the rite of process or rite of passage of becoming a shaman. And one of the schools of thought is that you must go through what they call Shinbyon, or a kind of illness, in Western, I guess, cultures, they would call it spiritual awakening. So basically, you have this path, this narrative that starts with illness, and then it makes its way into purification and self-awareness. And then it ends uh, with the realization that there are different ways of seeing reality, sort of extending one's understanding of realities, then takes you through a sort of a cycle of spiritual practices in Korean culture. So that is uh, starting with shamanism, and then it goes into Taoism, and then it ends in Buddhism. The main factor distinguishing this project is that we're making use of motion capture data for all of it. And by that, I mean, we're not focusing on animating human characters with this motion capture data. We're trying to animate nature or elements of nature with this data. And that is something I still don't feel like I have seen a lot of yet. Um, I see people trying to make things from nature, such as animals or plants, look like humans, but I have not seen people really use the data to maintain the essence of that element in nature. So that, I think, is actually really the main challenge for us with this project. Thank you. I think it's a really interesting project. After reading it, it makes me feel excited to see the final version. So could you please update us? What have you already finished and what is unfinished? How did you do the finished parts and what's your plan for the unfinished parts? So nothing is in a final state yet. What we're doing is what I understand to be rapid prototyping or iterative design. So we make something, we look at it, and then we change it, maybe completely change it, and then look at it again, etc. So right now there's three sections. The first one is Xinjiang, the second one is Onchan, and the third part is Cheo. Onchan is the one that had the most work done on it so far. So we do have a proof of concept for it. We just tested some ideas out about what does it look like to have all four seasons at once to see these shamans as represented through motion trails. In an Onchan or a hot springs or a bathhouse, you normally move around different bathtubs. So we were just trying to see test what happens when you give somebody the freedom to choose sort of which season or bathtub they are exploring. For Cheo, we're currently having to work something out, which is that 
The team originally met through an online residency sponsored by the City Contemporary Dance Company here in Hong Kong. We are trying to figure out if we can build off of the project we started as a team for that, or if we actually have to start over from the beginning. As for the first part, it is actually the oldest. So we being me and uh, So Jung Bam, we talked about it in April 2019. And we actually did record some motion capture data for that. However, I think we both agreed that we want to shape the visuals a bit differently than we originally planned. Because originally we thought to include a plant called a banksia. It's a kind of flower native to Australia. We wanted to create this garden of banksias. But now, as since her own life experiences have changed and my life experiences have changed since that time, I think that the environment that we create is also going to change. And then, of course, there's the issue of how to connect all three different parts so that it becomes a one long narrative. And I think that will also change a bit how we do the design. As you mentioned, dancing is one of the three key concepts embedded in the title of this artwork. And I noticed that in Auction, that it's a motion capture of your dancing part, like traditional shaman dancing. My question is, will dancing be thoroughly through the three parts of your artwork? Or will there be other forms of motion capture? In this case, the definition of dance that we are using would be more accurately described as somatic movement. I think for On Chan and Cheo, it will look a lot closer to contemporary dance as people are familiar with seeing on stages. However, for Xin Byung, I think it will be less refined, if that makes sense. It will be a little bit more pure human movement. Our goal is not to present this like very virtuosic or very identifiably human quote-unquote dance. Uh, I think for me at least the goal is to help people appreciate that simply watching movement even without a body is very mesmerizing. And I think people do this naturally. For example, the reason why people stare at water and watch like waves and ripples, or the reason why people watch branches move when trees are being hit by wind. I think humans are naturally fascinated by any kind of movement, not just movement that has a body at the center of it. It is true that for On Chan, movement is inspired more by traditional Korean dance, and that would be autumn. And then I would say winter also has that element to it. But then by the time you go into spring and summer, because those were the improvised sections, it does resemble a bit more what they would call sort of concert contemporary dance. And in Cheong, the experiment that we did as a team, Zelia is trained in several different dance forms, such as ballet, ballroom, contemporary dance. So some of that vocabulary naturally enters into her improvisation. Uh, but for Shin Byung, because So Jung was doing the movement, and we might re-record it, but at least the data we have right now, the only dance she ever trained in was hip-hop. But I remember that day that she was not really thinking of it in terms of trying to be a hip-hop dancer. She just wanted to express a certain kind of raw emotion. I, but I think this is appropriate for each stage of the narrative, because in the beginning, the main character will not have any idea of what is going on with them in terms of their illness. And then in the second part of the narrative, the idea is that they are being guided by other spirits or previous shamans. And then in the final section, the idea is sort of about 
moving with your peers, basically. So now you have found others just like you. <laughs> so I do hope that people can sense a shift in the definitions and quality of movement as they go through this narrative. I think it would be very, very boring if the execution of the movement was exactly the same in each section. Actually, I noticed one interesting point is that the name of each section, like single, ocean, chill, it's all originates from Korean. For me, like as a foreign audiences, it's a little bit difficult to grasp the meaning. So I would like to even talk it a little bit bigger, like the whole storytelling is all based on a traditional Korean story. So how do you balance your choice of following a traditional line of the story while at the same time reach more international viewers? One of the reasons why I decided to use a dramaturg is precisely for the question that you asked. And so So Jung is also also acting as dramaturg for the whole project because she was born and raised in Korea. So she has sort of that root to draw from. I have also asked someone who is not Korean to be a dramaturg as well to help balance that, to provide a perspective as to when things don't make sense. Maybe even if you don't know the exact terminology or the history, you might still have a life experience that is relevant to what is being shown here. And I have been finding parallels in other cultures. So, for example, in the U.S., there's a Native American tribe called the Lakota, and they have a concept of a shaman that they call Heoka. And when you read up that story, there's a similar kind of process where they have to go through some kind of vision ritual and then they end up having to take on certain duties. I've had people note that there are South American shops who go through a similar process or practice. I've heard about Mongolian shamans, again, doing similar things. There was sort of this, not quite a TED talk, but uh, similar to a TED talk where a photographer had been traveling around the world basically observing different types of shamans. And their experiences sounded also quite similar to what we want to show in this narrative. I think the way we are trying to balance it is that we are showing it in the context of Korean spiritual and cultural practices, which I am aware has connections out to Chinese and Indian practices, and by that I'm referring to Taoism and Buddhism, but that in terms of the base underlying experience, this is something that seems to be told in different ways in many different cultures. So perhaps the best way to put it is this is just maybe a Korean-American interpretation <laughs> of what seems to be a rather universal experience. Yeah, I think it's just about trying to change perspectives or open up perspectives and not so much about trying to say this is completely representative of all Koreans or all people with spiritual awakenings or things like that. Actually, you mentioned one concept I'm really interested in. You said there needed to be a body to show the movement and you also mentioned that you want to express nature through the movement you mimic nature like instead of using nature to mimic human movement so could you please elaborate more on this part sure so i think the obsession with removing the body started with too many years of classical ballet training. <laughs> uh, because uh, when you're a student dancer, you become very obsessed with your body. And, you know, people get hired sometimes not because their movement was the best, but because they have a body that somebody wants to use or thinks will look best on stage. Or we um, have sort of a 
some definition or preconception of what nature is. But what if we focused more on the energy and the essence of nature, which is then becomes something that requires more than just having a visual or aural sense. Then you have to start tapping a little bit more into your intuition, which then brings you back a closer to somatics. And so I think what's kind of fun about this is we've often talked about, all right, if we're creating an environment and we're going to say what nature is like for this virtual world, does it need to look exactly as we see it in this physical reality? Or can we focus more on representing it in different ways? One thing that I'm trying to think about is, for example, if I have a dragonfly going through the scene, does the dragonfly have to look exactly as we recognize a dragonfly? Or because this is a virtual reality, can we make the dragonfly look different but still have the same energy and feeling that a dragonfly gives. And I use dragonfly as a specific example, not only because of the symbolism, but because it's something that if you're living in Hong Kong or Korea or Japan or China, that it's something you see on a regular basis every summer. <laughs> so it's something that is very familiar. And if you think about it, it has a pattern. It will go zzz, and then like it pauses. And it lets you see long enough that actually it's not straight. It's actually kind of curved. And it kind of does a strange hovering thing. And then it takes off again. And then you notice actually it tends to run around with butterflies. And then it makes you wonder, well, why does it run around with a butterfly? And the patterns they make in the air. And... You know, it's interesting because that's not something exclusive to Asia. Actually, Prokofiev, in his ballet Cinderella, he has a section called Butterflies and Dragonflies. And that already gives you a hint in your head of like, oh, there is something about these two insects that, you know, really leaves a powerful impact. Why? You know, and so when you start getting very... I don't know, maybe philosophical. <laughs> it, it, it just opens things up a little bit more. And I just have to add that it's actually the first time in my life that I've had the time and space to ask these kinds of questions about nature or even about the artwork that I'm working with. As far as I know, the final version of the theater will be approached through VR. So how does VR contribute to the storytelling? How does VR make it different from traditional theater? So the main thing is that we're trying to create a new world. This is a term often heard of in film or video game design, the concept of world building. But you know, if you try to build a world for live performance, you're always constrained by physics. <laughs> and the equipment around you. So first and foremost, VR lets us not have to worry about physics and things like that in that sense. Obviously, uh, we don't have any haptic suits or anything, so we cannot completely erase physics as we know it, but at least visually, this will let us play around a bit more. Uh, another thought was the idea of accessibility. Another problem with live performance is that people have to come to a specific location. Whereas with this, as long as someone has the right equipment, uh, they can just load it up for themselves at home, wherever they are. And ideally, you know, maybe this it can be simple enough that it can run on a phone. We're not sure yet. We're trying to keep everything as simple as possible, though, because we know that not everyone can afford a fancy computer and things like that. I hope people will realize about VR is that it's a tool that can be used in many different ways, is how I see it. And so when you design for it, you have to 
remember that it could be used in all those different ways. And so you can't make something for all the different possibilities, but it does mean that when you choose which possibility you're going to focus on, that you just have to be very aware that it's for that particular setting. As I understand, you are exploring the self in this artwork, like self-development, like self-purification. So I want to dig deeper into this topic of self-representation. So do you use your artwork as a channel to represent your public self, like to build your public self in front of your audiences? So my relationship with art making changed a lot after I moved to Hong Kong. So that was about five years ago. I think it's reached a point where I use artistic forms of expression in order to make sense of certain phenomena or certain life experiences or things that I observe about the world around me. Things start from internally, from myself, because it's my observations of things happening around me. And I always feel like I do learn or change over time based off of the process because, you know, you, your perspectives change. Your perspectives can shift, right? To be totally honest, I think I always keep a little bit of myself hidden or there's always a bit of distance between myself and the work that is created. And the reason why I have this look on my face is because I'm trying to think back to the last time where I really created a work truly about myself. And that was about 15 years ago when I was 20. <laughs> and I think since that time, I have never really created a work in such a pure way after that. Even the works that were about myself, my experience, there was always a little bit of a distance. I think that's the difference from your public self and the true self. Like the public self is the self you display in front of the public. Ah. Like you, you hide some part of your true self from your public self. It's different. Yes. Well, I think the thing is any side of myself that I show is most definitely a side of me. It is part of me. Uh, Perhaps what a common complaint I've heard some, uh, people say is that they said, there are so many sides to you. Which side is your true side? <laughs> but that's what I love about the process of using art expression or expressing oneself through art is that you don't have to be the same person every single time. And actually, I feel rather disappointed when someone just shows the same side every time <laughs> because I'm like, oh, but there must be more. So can I understand it for every artwork, you just show one angle of your public self and then for multiple artworks, then it's kind of different angles of your public self and then all of them together kind of show part of your public self in front of your audiences. I think it's more that if you were to take everything I've ever made, you could get a sense of who I am. I wouldn't say it's public versus private self issue. I think it's just that a person needs to be very strong if they are going to make something without that distance. I have a feeling that is why some of the greatest artists in history really went quite mad, you know, in producing their masterpieces because they decided to close that gap and just really put everything out there. So maybe my self-critique would be, when I was 20, I had a chance to taste what it was like to do something without that distance. And I think after doing that, I realized that maybe I don't quite have the strength yet. So now I think with each project, I am trying to close that distance a little bit more. But if I can be very honest, I don't think I am quite strong enough yet to really have like a zero distance when I'm making something. Maybe when I'm 60. <laughs> Apart from artworks, 
So as a new media artist, how do you usually utilize your social media? Do you use your social media in a different way compared with ordinary people? How do you use it? I actually decided to close down some of my social media profiles because I realized that sort of artist persona and then the personal lives of people were starting to bleed together. It, it, it started to create a kind of depression for me. Because, you know, you, you just want to find out, you know, does your friend have a new puppy? Do you want to see their child? And instead, like every week, they are advertising a show or an award or something like that. It starts to create this feeling that your relationship with this person is very artificial, you know, and that you yourself always have to only talk about, you know, oh, I'm having an opening, or um, this is my latest work, or, you know, you, you start to feel like you cannot be your true self on a platform that was originally meant to help people just connect. And right now, I have a Facebook profile that I keep open only because I noticed that people keep asking for a link but actually I don't really use it and I've noticed some of my artist friends are very brave they put down some very personal deep experiences I really admire them for that I just start to feel sad because like for example I actually kind of like Instagram I think it's a great way to share interesting pictures and videos and so there are some people I follow just so I can see their projects. I really love that. But what I hate about Instagram is when people, yeah, start feeling like they have to show off about how wonderful they are. So maybe I wish there was like some kind of good social media channel for people to just share their creative expression without judgment. In that case, then I think I would use social media more. (laughs) But right now, I think somewhere along the line, because like some business people started telling everybody, oh, you have to use social media to advertise yourself and to make money. And, you know, your YouTube videos have to be a certain way so that you can get 100,000 subscribers. I think that really ruined social media it it really just ruined it <laughs> actually i found it quite interesting in your the fourth dialogue video i've done with new media artists and i found new media artists are quite cautious about their social media usage usually they don't want to expose too much on social media and they're very cautious and they think more before they even act well, someone proposed, like, uh, pr- probably you can have two channels, like one for personal life and one for artist life. How do you think it? Uh, I tried that. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried that. I've seen other people do that. I-, I think what is lost is community. I mean, okay, the whole world is getting very competitive. <laughs> but, you know, the art world and then even more so the new media art world can feel very, very competitive instead of feeling very communal, like instead of being inclusive. I would love to see how social media can be used to create safe spaces, communities for dialogue exchange, collaboration, to help people grow because it can be kind of lonely, actually. There are not actually a lot of people I know here who are working in VR or with motion capture. So I'm always having to talk to people in other countries. And I feel very lonely about that. If, you know, social media could help connect me to other people working on similar projects in a way that we're not feeling like we're competing with each other, but instead can support each other, I I think that would be amazing. As we have already discussed, you have two ways to communicate with your audiences. Like one is your artwork. You can 
express something through your artwork to reach your audiences and also there is social media so what kind of message do you want to convey what kind of things you want your audiences to get from you your emotions or other things so it's interesting because i think uh, this is actually a question that comes up when people talk about practice-based or practice-led research uh, like, what is the point of doing research when the artwork should speak for itself? I think, to be honest, artwork was maybe a little bit easier to interpret or understand when people had more common backgrounds, when people were more alike. And I think the challenge right now is that we have so much variety, and I think it's great. And, you know, the more types of people there are, the better. But then that means as an artist, it's really hard for anybody to come up with something that has a universally understood meaning. So I think that when social media and by extension, engaging in a research approach can help is that at least then you as the artist uh, can make clear your intention. You know, you can still leave things up for interpretation by others. But, you know, if you, if you don't take advantage of these opportunities to say, you know, this is what I was trying to do, this is what I was hoping to do, uh, then you leave yourself to the mercy of critics. I don't think it's fair on artists to have to simply put out their artwork and then hope that somebody will understand what they're doing. I think, yeah, things like social media can help create that dialogue, say, between an artist and a critic, or an artist and a public viewer, so that actually both sides can say, oh, is that what you were thinking? I see now. That's interesting. Actually, I'm particularly interested in the emotion part. So do you think, like, what your emotions could be able to reach your audience? Is that a sorrow way? I guess in my head, I was definitely thinking about emotions when I'm thinking about dialogue and things like that. Okay, so I, I guess what I will flip around is that, you know, do artists have to always maintain a certain set of emotions? Is it allowable for an artist to express, you know, the frustration, the sadness, the anger? the negative emotions that they experienced during the creative process or when they are misunderstood, are they allowed to express that they too are hurt by such a reaction? I feel like right now we're not allowed to be honest with our emotions. And by I say we, I mean anybody. But I think that's really hard on artists then to not be able to be honest and say I'm very happy with how this turned out, even if no one else likes it. <laughs> or to say, you know, I'm really frustrated. I got this award, but, you know, it's for something that I feel very unproud of. <laughs> or, you know, like those kinds of things. I, I feel like that freedom is necessary and it's not always given. So, yeah, that's why I say, you know, a dialogue is important because it's another way of, expressing and clarifying emotions because if you simply say like oh i'm so sad then everyone starts making up their own reasons right but if you can say i'm sad and then have a like say a public conversation with people about it then you know in a really good outcome maybe people can also start to see the artwork in a different way and say oh <laughs> there's a new depth or to see the artist in a different way and say, Oh, this person is not like an arrogant person. Actually, they're just dealing with a lot of anxiety. You, know? you have raised up this really interesting point. Now what we have is this one way through artists to audiences. It's, doesn't really give artists a chance to respond to the audience's reaction. So this is quite interesting. And I would like to finish our conversation with one last question. We've talked about to be public self, artists could use artworks and social media. Is there any other channel come up 
to your mind that they may use to be their public self? One thing that I struggled with is the question of whether artists need to be performers. Whenever I go to conferences or artist talks, I'm always so confused because so many of these artists don't perform when they are talking. And I'm like, wow, but on stage or through your artwork, you're able to show so much expression. The public is not used to seeing artists just mixed around in the street or something, right? We always think of the artist in the studio or like, you know, we only see their work, we don't see them. Or even when we have a talk, it's they're over here and the audience is over there, kind of like, I think that's why there's more of these open studio and live streaming events happening. I think the more that the public understands what it is that goes on during a process, and then they realize that this person is also a human, just like them. I think that would go a long way. You know, that can take so many different forms whether it's through like community engagement, whether it's through community projects or that kind of thing, whether it's just opening up through live streaming or through just doing one's art in a public space, whether just having a conversation, <laughs> you know, at a cafe with somebody <laughs> about what it means to be doing their work, all these different things. There are more options than I'm e I've even listed. I think you're bringing up a good question about this whole public self versus private self. Obviously, we don't want to all become celebrities. That's a very hard life. But then again, I think maybe it's also a matter of challenging the public to realize that you don't have to turn people into celebrities. You can just appreciate them for what they are and what they do.